Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Ben Cat. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Scorpio Season, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa. Ben Cat, did you have a snack that you're eating today? Oh, so we're talking about the letter Q today. Um, did you have a, a snack that... Yeah, I did. And this one was both hard and special, but I made myself some quesadilla. Oh, nice. Yep. It's corn quesadilla. With, uh, it's actually quite fancy. It's got a bunch of veggies in it. Onions and uh, what else did I have in it? I think some sort of squash and mushrooms. All right. And um, you have bailed on the snack this time, looks like. I did. I, yeah, I did bail on the snack. I had some coconut water. I tried making queso and my queso didn't come out. So, so what happened to the queso? quite sad. I didn't use like a real recipe. I just tried to like melt some cheese and some milk together and it it's like not it's not the right consistency. It looks like yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Every time we fail to make a snack, we should sort of force you to eat it anyway. Oh. <laughs> oh, I was eating it. It's tasty. It's just not something I want to like show on air necessarily. Uh, I'm making coconut water. It doesn't start with you. Uh, your standards are too high. All right, so the letter Q, and it's an interesting letter. Yeah. If you were playing Scrabble, Q would be like eight points or something, right? And if you put that on a double, triple letter score and crap, it's one of the best letters to have. Yeah, there were 10 points actually. Oh, there but yeah. 10, okay. yeah, you get like 30 points for putting on a triple letter score. Triple word yeah. score is probably where you really want it, maybe, I guess. Actually, I don't know. Anyways. We should like start introducing some sort of Scrabble motif into this uh, podcast. So Q is a high stakes letter. All right. It's an eight point podcast today. Or 10 point, sorry. 10 point podcast. 10 point podcast. Yeah, I like right. that. That's good. Um, cool. Well, so first on our list of Q things, the first topic we have up is a uh, quite an easy one, you know, everyday stuff. Um, quantum mechanics. <laughs> Which we kind of started talking about this stuff back in this stuff. We talked about quantum <laughs> mechanics a couple times on this show. Um, once when we talked about graphs or maybe hypergraphs, and we talked a little bit about, I'm not going to name him correctly. Uh, David Deutsch. Uh, it came up with David Deutsch. It came up with uh, Richard Feynman. Deutsch. Oh, I forgot about Deutsch. Yeah. Uh, I think entanglement. So we've actually talked about it a bunch of times. All right. Yeah, it's kind of a, a theme running through the Scorpio season one. Um, so let's talk yeah. about quantum as a theme, maybe, since we've covered a lot of like um, more specific things about physics and stuff before. So uh, what do you think quantum mechanics as sort of a broader theme is like in pop culture and the zeitgeist and stuff? Yeah, so isn't there like, um, there's like the James Bond movie, right? Quantum Solace? Oh yeah, Quantum of Solace. Yeah, I like that one. I have, so I, I couldn't tell you what it's about. I just remember like the name, but the fact that like I feel like quantum is like a it was like the new sexy thing for like the sixties, right? It was like definitely like a, a signifier of um, being yep. incredibly futuristic or like yeah, futuristic. It was like a, it's a futurism signifier. So I think that like. Uh, maybe us talking about it on Scorpio season means that we are like trying to signal how futuristic we are by like um, the fact that we like talk about quantum stuff is like yeah we're like on cutting edge whatever because of, and you can say that because we like you know we're, we're quantum we are on cutting edge for like 1960 you said that for yourself so we're kind of more retro I think now it's, I to be, it's like one of those things right like the profession uh, regarded as the cutting edge uh, brainiac profession changes like back yeah. in the day it used to be rocket scientists that was during the yeah. space and then that vanished so I'm kind of a has-been because I'm a rocket scientist so I would have been cool in like 1955 then it became I think uh, uh, I think it was computer science for a while so when were brain surgeons cool brain surgeons were cool oh yeah yeah while. brain surgeons were cool for a while uh, uh, what's cool nowadays? Like self-driving car something, maybe? No, th those don't have a connotation of like genius intelligence. They're like just Silicon Valley hacker technology building entrepreneurship type intelligence. It's not the same connotation, right? Mm. Like um, yeah, you right. wouldn't say to somebody like, uh, oh, you're a driverless car person. Maybe AI, like would, does AI have that connotation yeah. now? Like 
Oh, I think AI what? does for sure. I mean, I think that like, oh, okay. So one, another podcast that I'm a pretty big fan of, I mean, I don't watch it all the time, but uh, Lex Friedman's podcast, like started as an AI podcast, but the reason I started watching it is they interviewed a famed quantum computer scientist, uh, Scott Aronson. Um, so if, if quantum is like the indicator that you're trying to be a futuristic show, I think that like the fact that the AI podcast started talking to quantum, quantum scientists is like it trying to like definitely show that it like covers any future reaching tech. Um, you know, it expanded beyond AI to include other things and the other things that included like, of course, it's quantum because that's like how you signal that you're doing Okay. It. Um, so I think you are bringing up an important point. Like quantum today is cool in a different way than quantum in 1960s, right? Mm -hmm. Like quantum today refers to like mostly comes along with computing. So quantum plus computing. So it's cool in sort of an updated way where it has merged with computer science and AI also, I guess. So I think there yeah. aren't any, it's still at like Shor's algorithm and very simple kinds of computation. It's not yet like AI level smart, I think. Uh, but back in the 60s, I think, uh, quantum stuff was uh, like Heisenberg's world. Like, was it quantum cool in the 60s because of like nuclear reactors and stuff? Like being like a nuclear engineer used to be like kind of sexy. Like that was like yes, 60s yes. quantum was like physical engineering. Like, like uh, But that's, that's different though. I think that was a different kind of separate chapter of cool. So quantum mm -hmm. sort of uh, theory was started what in the 1920s? By the time yeah. the first pop science stuff started coming out in like 1930s or 40s, I think um, the atom bomb and the atomic age, they were cool in kind of a much more classical sense because the quantum aspects of like nuclear fission and fusion weren't nearly, uh, weren't center stage. Whereas when quantum actually became center stage, it all became about like, you know, entanglement and weird action at a distance or mm. what is it? Not weird. Spooky, spooky action, action at a distance. At a distance. Yeah. yeah. So all those That's sort of cool Einstein things. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it became cool in the sixties as sort of a broad metaphor of uh, deep uncertainty. And it kind of got vaguely philosophical, right? Uh, was it, uh, I think Schrodinger was the one who wrote that book. What is life? Have you read that? It's a very, yeah, it's a very slim volume called What is Life? I might even have it right here somewhere. No, I have it somewhere. But yeah, so uh, Schroding, uh, Schrodinger became, is it Schrodinger or Heisenberg who wrote the book? Well, they're both- Heisenberg kind of wrote a book that's like a philosophy of, um, I have it. I have, the, I have the Heisenberg's essays on the philosophy of like what quantum, whatever means. Um, but this Schrodinger, is, I think Schrodinger also wrote one. Yeah, I think that is the What is Life book. And it's kind of funny that I'm having doubts about it. It's like, you know, quantum uncertainty about which quantum mechanics pioneer wrote a book. Uh, but uh, let me Google that right now. Uh, but I okay. Think all wrote books. Like, I think all of them wrote books. We just don't ever really hear about them. We hear about like their theories. We don't hear about the books they wrote so much. Oh yeah, um, it is uh, Schrodinger wrote What is uh, Life. Yeah. In this book, he introduced the idea of an aperiodic crystal that contained genetic information, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not, I own the book, but I haven't read it, so I should have been cop to that. Oh, um, I see. Okay. Yeah, uh, but it, it, I'm viewing it more as an indicator of cool, right? Because if you're an uh, obscure theoretical physicist who's really famous in the physics world, and you have mainstream crossover appeal by writing a pop science book, like we talked about Feynman a few episodes ago, and he had that crossover success too, but most yes. physicists 100%. don't. Yeah, Schrodinger did because of the cat, right? Like he, I don't, okay. yeah. Uh, and the cat became a major pop culture <laughs> motif. I love that, okay, right. So cats have always been like a pop culture meme, right? Like you just gotta hook your theory on the back of a cat and it'll like go <laughs> viral. Like the mimetic cat is like the, um, the way to like achieve like whatever salience you want culturally just gotta figure out a way to rope it into like your theory yeah, i'm trying to think where else um, quantum mechanics has made its way into pop culture oh we talked about um, dirk gently last time right um, as an ontological detective um so he does a lot of quantum crap so in the first novel he makes up a complete bullshit theory and invokes the cat and uh, uses that to solve the mystery somehow. So there's that. 
And um, oh yeah, one of my other favorite authors, Terry Pratchett, it, there's a running theme of quantum entanglement and quantum mechanics through the entire like 40 plus novels, but mostly it's parodied as a joke where it's like um, used as a buzz phrase when you want to like obscure something and he just calls it the quantum. Like, oh, we don't know what it means. It's the quantum. And the funny thing is, this is a college of magicians. So this world is a magical world. And there's like a university of magic kind of thing. It's called the Unseen University. And mm -hmm. they do the equivalent of high energy physics, which I think they call high energy magic or something. And so they use a lot of like fake quantum mechanics and quantum becomes like a joke, a running joke. Okay, so that was quantum and it's now quantum computing. So yeah, I would say, yeah. Uh, quantum computation is now the epitome of um, being a brainiac. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. What's his name? Uh, Scott, uh, Scott Aronson definitely counts as one of the people regarded as uh, modern geniuses, right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I actually bought his, his philosophy book. I'm excited about reading it. It's like quantum mechanics since um, whatever the guy did, Mocrates or something like that. I think we are... Uh, Almost at 10 minutes. We started late recording today because of uh, Zoom problems, right? And I forgot to start the timer, but yeah, I think we are almost at 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but let's um, have uh, closing uh, thoughts on quantum before moving on. Um, Do you have a closing, closing thought on quantum? On quantum. Um, I don't really have, I mean, I was going to try and tie it to like spooky action or something. Um, like maybe there's a Quantum is entangled with our like our concept of um, of cool culture, cool nerd nerd culture. Um, it's not I wouldn't say spooky ways, but I think it's hard to get away from. I think we can say a little bit more about that. Like cool is one of those undefinable concepts, right? So if you claim to be cool, you're not cool, and if you claim not to be cool, you're not cool. But you kind of have to be in this weird superposition of nobody can c quite tag you whether you're oh yeah okay here's my sort of definition of a quantum definition of cool um, you know pure in group people are seen as like boring social conformists and sheep within a group right and pure yeah. out group people are black sheep who are sort of seen as pure outcasts but in between your tangles so i think cool is when you're kind of like people can't make out whether you're in the group or out of the group so, um, that's my definition of cool so that makes you quantum cool all right, there we go. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Great. So our next topic after quantum, the uh, I don't know if this is as cool a topic to talk about is um, questions. Um, and I isn't there like isn't there a uh, art of asking questions like like as a like isn't there like what's the like I wanted to say it's not epistemology or like the I can't even remember what that word means. Um, but kind of like the like the isn't that like a science of asking questions? That's not just science, is it? Like uh, I don't think. Well, it, it, there's cultures of it. The Socratic method is basically asking questions so that the student kind of discovers their knowledge. So that's why is that what you're thinking of? No, I'm not. I guess I'm like, is there like a um, is there like a like do we have a word in English culture for like the um, the art of asking questions. So like, I really wanted, I like, I tried to get AA a girl to come on, not very successfully. Um, my outreach to her was a little hit or miss, but um, I, cause she, <laughs> she, I think like really embodies um, this like, like basically her rhetorical style, or I feel like a large part of her Twitter style of like existing online is asking questions. She just, and they're not, but it's not Socratic. Cause I always feel like Socratic always has like a, um, I feel like Socratic usually has like a target in mind. So you like, or maybe not necessarily a target, but it's like personal and focused enough that you can create like a narrative out of it. Like you're driving towards like a point where there's like some revolution or like uh, maybe yep. um, cliff that you fall off at the end that is like self recognition or like a reversion yep. in the way that you see yourself or like some sort of like growth happens along the line of Socratic questioning. Whereas yeah, sort of Socratic questioning, questioning I would say is not even really questioning because there's a there's an element of not necessarily bad fate, but an element of the questioner knows the answer that he's trying to provoke out of the um, student or listener, right? So there's no mutual discovery of like uh, new information. So to me, a genuine question is where you are genuinely in a position to be surprised by one of the answers that comes up. Like you may know some of the possible answers, but you could be surprised. Yeah, right, right. 
And Aya girl, she asks a lot of sort of, I don't know, she's kind of like a female edge lord. Uh, does edge lord need a female qualifier? I think most edge lords are guys, but yeah, she asks those edgy questions that kind of make people a little uncomfortable, right? I, I never. <laughs> I, she's all gotten the, very famous for some of those, yeah. Yeah. Infamous. Uh, yeah, I play. Uh, I do a lot of polls, so it's not quite questions because I'm like preloading the answers. But often I play like subversive polls where the answers reveal something other than what they claim to, and then. Part of the reason for laying out options is uh, having people like critique them and argue with the poll, right? Right, yeah. So I mean, that's semi-Socratic by offering, like, I mean, that's not exactly, but like you could, I think you could make a case that by laying out options, you are, it's semi-Socratic. Yeah, so, sometimes I You're lay out your hand options before. in sort of good faith ways, but other times I knowingly put in a bunch of wrong answers to get the you know, annoyed right answer. Like there's that, uh, uh, you've heard of, I think it's called Cunningham's Law, which says that the uh -huh. best way to get the right answer on social media is to post the wrong answer. Oh yeah, I was actually thinking about this today when I was like tweeting some random stuff out. Yes, I didn't realize it had that name, but I'm I'm familiar with it. I think this works really well in tech circles too, not just on Twitter. Yeah, and it's related to the phenomenon of uh, nerd sniping, right? Where you, uh, it's not exactly posting a wrong answer, but posting something that sort of um, trolls nerds who have like detailed, refined knowledge of something. Like, you know, confusing Star Wars and Star Trek um, deliberately, that will get all the fans riled up. So I'm dating yeah. myself. Like, would you call that kind of behavior a form of edgelord behavior? Is edgelord behavior more about like finding the edge and questioning the edge exactly? And, like, I wouldn't call that edgelord behavior. That's just kind of more trolling, like basic trolling. It can okay. be good natured or bad natured. I think edgelording is getting to the edge of what pe makes people uncomfortable, right? Like um, getting to questions that they kind of like uh, walk on eggshells around and just going there where other people are not willing to go, either with a dank meme or a well-posed sort of uncomfortable question, which um, I think Aego does a lot. Is that how you pronounce A-E? What is A-E-L-L-A? -L -L is that like, I, can't, I don't know how to pronounce that. I always want to say it like paella, paella. <laughs> like. <laughs> All right. I might be wrong. I mean, I could do the like, sort of like oh it's kind of like spanish ao which means girl so it's like a girl <laughs> i uh, i don't know but that i don't actually know a girl at all so okay but if that was it it would be girl girl so it would just be like saying the same thing twice um if it was spanish. yeah she's a she's a good data point in uh, what i overall think of as prompt twitter so uh, prompts yeah. are slightly different from questions and i think twitter is much better at prompts than questions and in fact any forum that tries to start out being about questions, if it succeeds at all, it kind of devolves into prompting. Like Quora, that's what happened. Like Quora, when it started, it was actually a good Q&A forum. But at some point, it became <coughs> clear that the way to get popular on Quora is to post good prompts rather than questions. So something like, uh, this is what made me actually leave Quora. Like the questions of the sort, like uh, which is the most iconic song ever for the 60s? I mean. That's not a question. That's like asking people to like, uh, I don't know, perform identity by posting their favorite 60s song, right? So it's, that's, and I like Twitter for that because Twitter doesn't pretend to be about Q and A. It's like literally like straight up about prompts, which is at least honest. Yeah, that's true. That's good. So do you have any big unanswered questions lately, Venkat, that you feel like people should be working on? Hmm. Yeah, one I think I've been thinking about a lot is how do you criticize the excesses of the left without being co-opted by the right? It's like a needle I think many people are trying to thread on social media right now. It's, uh, do you know what I mean? It's like you criticize anybody getting canceled or you know some sort of woke um, outrage cycle and immediately it's like, oh, you've been, you're being celebrated by, I'll try trolls and before you know it, if you're not careful or if you're too, too clueless, you get sucked into the vortex and you become part of it before you know it. So that, yeah. that's, that's a question I have on my mind, not just personally, but as 
as a thing in online culture. It's like a phenomenon that uh, needs some sort of counter programming. Yeah, I mean, I think that to a certain extent, even like sometimes like being a woman in certain spaces, there's just certain things that I won't say ever. Um, not because it's not stuff that I believe in, but because there's too great a chance that some someone will pick up on the fact that I said that thing and decide that it means it becomes like a banner that you can then break across any other like woman basically that ever tries to enter that space ever mm -hmm. because some representative human like said a thing one time um and that, that yeah, i think i know the kind of thing you're talking about we've dm'd about a couple of examples okay, of yeah. this i think <laughs> yeah yeah i remember dming you about stuff i don't remember exactly what i'm i'm kind of forgetful but yeah yeah, and like there's like stuff that like, so I mean, I think that's like, I think that's a good question I'm trying to say, Bankhead. I think it cuts across like a bunch of different, like yeah. any, any person who's saying things in public, like, yeah, it's really hard to like make good, honest observations about things that don't feed into these moot wars. Um, yeah, and, like, it's like there's, this is a bad term for it, but. Um, it's like trying to occupy the centrist without necessarily accepting all the connotations of the word centrist. Like I don't consider myself a centrist. I have like a bunch of isolated positions that add, don't add up to a position. Uh, but yeah, anytime you sort of, um, what do they call it in logic? The law of the excluded middle, right? Where if you um, say, if you're not X, then you're um, X. Or if you're X, you're not X. It's like a result of polarization. Yeah. So what questions are you thinking about lately? Oh, I, sorry, I had one more comment I wanted to make that my brain's like thinking about, but I was like not wanting to make these statements as kind of like not wanting to hand out banners for the MOOC wars. Like, mm -hmm. you're like, as soon as I say this thing, it's just someone's going to pick it up. Like, oh my God, look at this beautiful flag. I'm just going to wave it around on my like journey to wherever. And you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not a flag. Like, I'm not a banner factory. You can't just like, I mean, you can, but like, I have to be careful not to hand out banners because that might, that might cause a war somewhere else i don't know um like uh i didn't cause a war but cause trouble for other people you didn't mean it to who, yeah i mean um, it's, yeah, i think i prefer the metaphor of um, handing out ammunition so you don't want to give ammunition to the wrong people yeah so, exactly yeah. exactly and i think that is kind of a form of self-censorship like yeah. not even a lie it's like yeah mm, i don't know if it's self-censorship or just pragmatism because the fact is um, discourse doesn't happen in the abstract amongst a bunch of like faceless, nameless people. It's like you're talking in a particular situation with particular people in the context. And it's like, yeah, if there's two warring sides, then everything you say can and will be used for or against you by one side or the other. So if you shut up, it just means you don't care to be involved in the context a little bit. But mm, sometimes, yeah. Oh, I, I should, uh, one more thing I have to say on questions is um, I wrote a post like, uh, 10 years ago, but this was on a Xerox blog that has since gotten deleted. But it was one of the, my best posts and unfortunately no copy survives, but uh, oh, no. a piece of it does. So the core of it was how to ask good questions and uh, you know not the obvious surface questions, but the real questions. And there's mm -hmm. a scene in uh, an Agatha Christie novel, I think it's Lord, Lord Edgware Dies, in which they're sitting and discussing the murder mystery and sort of going over the clues and notes and sort of trying to assess the situation. And Poirot asks um, his dumb partner Hastings, all right, what question is on your mind? And Hastings comes back with, well, the most important question is who killed Lord Edgware, right, the victim. And it's the most obvious question you can ask in a murder, like who killed the victim? And uh, Poirot comes back with, that's a really stupid question because it's like, gets you nowhere and he offers the quest he offers like actual meaningful questions that are mysterious like why didn't lord edgware receive the letter so there was like somewhere in the plot a letter was mailed to lord edgware but he claims never to have received it right so asking why didn't he receive it is an actual meaningful question so that really is you know, kind of stuck with me and uh, anytime i sort of talk about questions and asking good questions i keep referring to that anecdote that's cool. All right. Oh, yeah, but you didn't um, answer my question, which is what questions are you thinking about lately? I don't know that I've been thinking about big questions lately. I think, okay, so I think the biggest questions that I usually seem preoccupied with is when 
other people are going to figure out what I've already figured out. Um, it's a little bit of Cassandraism, I think. Um, like, uh, like, like you. There's things that you see, and it's just like, when is like, when are other people going to start seeing it the way I see it? Because um, they're going to start seeing it the way I see it at some point. Um, at some point, it will be too obvious not to see. Um, it's just a matter of like, when is that going to happen? Um, I think like one example of it is, and I've started seeing more people finally start cluing in on it. Is like kind of what I. I think someone else invented this term, which to me is like great evidence that other people are finally starting to also see it. And I'm not the mm -hmm. only one making the point and that it's like finally gaining a little bit of um, like a foothold is like Brazilification. Um, okay. I think this has been like, I was having a moment and like I've been waiting for it to have a moment for like years now. Um, like just kind of slow, key, low key watching Brazilification happen and like not really, you know, it's like, okay, when is that, when is this going to be obvious to anyone else? The obvious is so what are some signs it's that it's like happening? Right huh? what, what are some signs that Brazilification is happening right now? Oh yeah, uh, the protest stuff to a certain extent, the slide, like the tent cities, like the um, problems people are having with not wanting to call the police because the police are corrupt or aren't going to help them. Oh, um, okay. But also still having to deal with like poor people that are like encroaching on their territory. And like, so they saw a friend sent me like an article from I wanna say Minnesota that um, people in a nice like suburban neighborhood had basically got a tent city roll into their local park and it was causing trouble, be causing trouble in the sense that like people would find passed out people in like their um, their buildings uh, elevator or one of the guys they interviewed yep. had just gotten robbed at gunpoint. So this is like, this is like Brazilian problems. Like, um, uh, like aren't they the, general third world problems though? In what sense are they Brazilian problems? It's like a, there's the, the incursion of um, the poor living right next to people of means and like the, and this is the, the context of this like um, particular community ending up in the press is that they didn't want to call the police. And so it's how they were dealing yeah. with all these problems. And the article didn't really have an answer that they were even answering the question of how to deal with like poverty and want and getting like, um, you know, people who are just having a bad time. Um, or like, you know, like robbing you on the street and like, like not being able to call the police or whatever. Um, I don't know. I like, yeah. that's sort of like, it's like minor violence or like minor inconveniences of like living near, um, maybe poverty isn't the right word for it. I know not I'm all impoverished people like steal or whatever. I don't even know how you classify that. Um, I I've been calling it the fourth world effect. So it's not exactly third world, but it's like, countries that used to be developed, but that have since fallen and have gotten worse than third world in some ways, because you can't even go back to like traditional forms of like uh, social support. Like India, I would consider is somewhere between second and third world. And that's partly because the state is so weak that this kind of like, you know, rich and poor living next to each other, there are like existing traditional mechanisms for dealing with sort of the boundary conflicts, right? There's like yeah. traditional, um, even though some of it is ugly, like caste based, relationship structures that may be ugly but are stable so you know fourth world is when you used to be more developed then sort of fail to make it all the way and then fall back and i think the u.s is a great example of fourth world uh, uh, dynamics uh, but brazilification more specifically i think yeah there's some dynamics to for example armed violence being a big part of it uh, but are there other signs like uh, when you mentioned the word the first thing that came to mind is uh, my wife and i we both uh, like eating these uh, things that Whole Foods now sells called Grazi Bites. So they're these little balls of, um, I think, taro and cheese or something. I don't know what it's made out oh, of. Oh, cheese balls. Yeah, those cheese balls. Cheese balls, okay. Yeah, it's, but you know, you it's a Brazilian thing, right? Bolo de queijo. Yeah, it means cheese ball. They're cheese oh, balls. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's what I thought you meant by Brazilification. <laughs> oh, that's a thing too. But like, I mean, I saw this great tweet yesterday that's like some, someone had posted on Facebook for how they rented a U-Haul truck for two days. So they paid $40 for U-Haul truck um, rental, just like a van. 
and they the van in it is like I want to say like a six liter van size so they swapped it out with the the engine they had in their car which was a 4.8 so they paid $40 for like you know for an engine upgrade so the van is now <laughs> running on a 4.8 liter engine and their car now has a six liter engine it took them two days to do the work so you know they paid $40 to the truck rental that is like that is like the, there's a Brazilian word for that. It's called jeitinho, which means like the literal <laughs> translation is little way, but it basically means like, you know, like you can do it. Is it legal and ethical? No, but you know, there's a, there's a little way to get through it. Like there's a little way to like upgrade your truck without outlaying thousands of dollars to buy a new engine. Um, and the little way is by like, kind of like fudging the rules a little or like sort of like cheating. It's like a little bit of cheating. Like there's a little, like there's this like, there's like oh, this is not a little bit of cheating. It's stealing cheating. an engine. It's yeah. literally stealing an engine. Yeah, but you know, did, did they still have an engine, Venkat? Did they actually <laughs> steal the engine? They stole like 1.2 liters worth of engine power by doing a little okay. trade. I'm going to call this the Brazilification of Lisa. <laughs> No, but like it's a Brazilian, like the Brazilians have like vocabulary for it. And like, uh, it's like, you know, social institutionalization around it via the vocabularization of it. Um, okay. which, like, I think uh, I, I English does have a like, word oh, for it. What? Like, I think English does have a word for it. It's just theft. But, uh, but I have not, like, I think. It's not actually, I mean, the fact the person was posting this on Facebook, like, hey, look at the cool thing I did. Like, cause if it was actually theft, you wouldn't do that, right? Uh, if you don't expect you to get caught, you wouldn't do that. But it is like, I think, legally and technically um, theft. Like uh, the truck owner who rented it to you could file a police complaint and have like a case that it's actually theft. You yeah, took somebody's it's... engine and put in a, another engine. Yeah. I mean, you can't do that. It's like... Well, you can though. That's the whole point. That's yeah, you can, but... Thing. That's the whole Brazilification is. That's the whole, that's the whole Brazilification is, is that it starts to occur to people these things that they can do and actually probably get away with it. I think uh, a sort of example that's within my boundary line of not theft is people buying clothes um, for a you know, special event and then wearing them very carefully and then just returning them. That's, okay, I think, borderline good. okay. Yeah, is it though? I don't know. I mean, that's also a JT. Like, that that's, that's also theft, but you're just stealing a rental, so to speak. Maybe he's going to rent the truck and give it back later. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Right. I doubt it. We will give him the benefit of the doubt on that. All right, we're All way right. over time with questions. All right, um, let's move, move on, on to the next, to the next one. The next let's thing on the list is quitting. Quitting. Oh, God. Okay. Venkat, I feel like we've talked about your penchants for quitting things that you find hard um, before. Um, what are some examples of things you've quit? Hmm. I don't think it's like a big project level quitting tendency. It's, it's more like small day-to-day -day stuff, which is like, um, I don't know. I need a spoon to eat this ice cream, but I can't find a spoon, so I won't eat ice cream. Something like that, you know? Like just giving up with you uh, at the first sign of like a slight difficulty. It's like, fuck it, I can just do without this. Or I can't find a book, I'll read another book. Or you know, like I have a tendency not to fix small things and either do without or find like a workaround that works well enough and then just let it either fix itself or not. Like actually, yeah, the Zoom thing. Uh, we were having trouble starting today's recording session, right? Because when yeah. I usually I go onto the browser to the Zoom website and click login, and I use Facebook for login, and the integration seems to be broken or something right now, and it wasn't letting me log in. And I was like, how do I fix this? Do I need to clear the cache or something, something? Do I need to go reset the connection from Facebook or something? I did that for like 30 seconds, and then I was like, I quit. I'm going to tell Lisa I'm not recording today. But then it occurred to me, all right, I can try maybe one more thing which is just fire up the app without going to the browser and log in via the app. And that worked. So even though I haven't yet fixed the problem, I've quit on the actual problem, it happened to work. But yeah, if the app hadn't worked, I would have told you, yeah, let's not do it. Because I, yeah, <laughs> I, I tend not to find things. Uh, interesting. So you kind of just like, it's more of a goes along with how reality has presented itself to you at this particular moment. Yeah. And one thing that's more in your domain, I think this is one reason I'm a terrible programmer. Like the only language I attained any level of um, expertise in is MATLAB and it's the most sandbox like 
uh, playpen environment for research programming ever. It's like so self-contained, it's hard to like mess up MATLAB programming. So other languages have kind of programmed in a little bit, like, um, you know, there's still toy languages like basic, I've done a little bit, Fortran, C, but I've never gotten good at any of them. And one of the reasons I think is if you're working in a real programming language in a real production environment, but like uh, compilation and all sorts of sort of um, errors from like, you know, environment variables and stuff, there's a lot of troubleshooting you have to do, like lots of like little, little things you have to troubleshoot and get right, configuration variables, environment variables. And it's like, I give up very, very easily on that stuff. So it's not that I'm not mentally capable of like the core part of programming, which is writing the code, but all this environment stuff makes me quit. Oh, I was gonna say, I feel like, so as a new programmer, especially the hardest problems you'll solve in the first like three years of programming are all those kinds of problems, I think. Like those are the hardest problems to solve. It's all configuration. It's all like little things not being up, set up exactly right, and you don't know why. And your job for like three years is figuring out why those things aren't working the way that they are. And it's never any of the actual like programming per se. Like programming per se is easy. Like the environmental context that your stuff is embedded in, however, is like usually more of a problem than anything. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And I think this is partly a problem of like personality and laziness and quitting personalities like me, but partly also a function of the way programming is taught. So the best way to kind of, I think, yeah. learn programming is to have a project you're passionate about and just want it so badly you figure everything out along the way. But the next best way I think is, I was, the first programming language I was taught was basic, which I think is kind of lousy. You should but back then this was like PCs, like 1980s, um, the early PCs. So this, I took my first uh, programming classes in like 1988. But I think mm -hmm. today, if I were to teach a programming class, I would say start with shell scripting because shell scripting forces you to all scripts. things that will force you to quit, right? Fucking love them. They're fucking great. Yeah. If I like, honestly, I think that like, if I don't think we should teach programming in high school, I think that's dumb. I think everyone and their mother should take Lisa's class on Unix, like shell scripting. Cause like it teaches you everything you need to know about computers. It's not about programming. Fuck programming. Who cares about mm -hmm. programming? Just fucking learn how to like use the command line. And that's like, that will get you through like 95% more of shit than like knowing how fucking for loop works. Like Exactly. <clears throat> and I never Actually, got I really good at shell scripts, but I, yeah. I, I'll point out that one thing I did get really good at, which a lot of um, academics end up doing is uh, LaTeX. So LaTeX is a very fussy typesetting program with lots of configuration crap and stuff. So that mm -hmm. just because I was absolutely forced to, to just typeset my papers and thesis, I had to learn yeah. LaTeX. And yeah. uh, my first book, I typeset myself in LaTeX as well. So I'm reasonably good at that. But yeah, I never got good at very general sort of friction stuff in programming. And that's my quitting personality. I quit at those things. It's actually a book. So just to like throw it out there, if anyone wants to learn about command line stuff, um, the Unix programming environment, it's this old ass book. It's written by the same guys who wrote like the C book, I think like Kernigan and Richie or one of mm -hmm. the whatever. But it's like, it's so great. It like starts with like, you know, nothing about computers or the shell or anything and just slowly builds you all the way up to like really cool complicated stuff in like 200 pages um so it's got a really nice on ramp then again i might be a little biased in that i read it after already knowing a lot of stuff but i learned a lot even even so um i would like recommend that book I, like i think like there should that should be a class that every high school student has to do is like we just we just walk through this book like that's it that's all we do maybe not the yeah. whole thing maybe just like the first couple of chapters but that's like that would be it that Oh, I feel like that would demystify computers a lot, I think, in a cool way. Uh, but I think we've gone down a bunny trail of uh, programming as a specific yeah, yeah. domain of quitting. Uh, what else? Uh, are you a quitter on any front or are you just not a quitter? I don't know, man. I really do think I'm a quitter. I think I'm a quitter. But I think that, like, to a certain extent, you could look at other things, like the actual real threads of my life and be like, no, actually, you don't really quit on things. I don't know. I go back and forth. Um, I think I'm a quitter because there's like projects, personal projects that I haven't finished or like launched. Like I have very like ambitious goals. So like <laughs> it's impossible to ship every ambitious goal. Um, I don't know. For a long time, I thought I was like giving up on the dumb like Faraday cage project thing. Like I was pretty sure I was going to quit on that. 
there were a couple times I was convinced I'd quit at that project, mm -hmm. but it finished itself. Somehow it got finished. I don't know who finished it. it wasn't me. I mean, it was me, but like, <laughs> it's like, it's weird. I actually have this, like, I think it's actually kind of like a not great psychology around like actually believing I'm a quitter. Um, even when there's like physical, real hard physical evidence that I did not quit on that difficult, long drawn out fucking project. Like, somehow in my brain that only remembers like the five times that i like didn't do the thing um i don't know like i still haven't but have you ever actually thought, like thing like, is like mass production whatever i think about that a lot what have you explicitly quit like literally given up and walked away from what have you quit as an example piano piano okay. quit piano when i was like 10 crying it was the horrible it was like the most horrible thing i couldn't do it i was like i have to <laughs> I can't do it. Just don't make me go, please. No, no more. Um, yeah. Most of I quit. Um, I don't know. I quit, I quit a musical instrument too. I took tabla lessons for several years and at some point I was like, I can't keep this up. So I just quit. I couldn't get to the next level. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've quit a bunch of things. But, but I think quitting in general actually is a very good thing. Like people don't yeah. do it enough or wisely enough or early enough. I think what's much worse than quitting is never admitting to yourself that you're not going to finish something and then sort of pretending and dragging it along and along. Uh, but it takes, I think, experience to realize when that's happening versus when the timing is just not right. Like there are certain things where I started like 10, 15 years ago and it's been sort of a nascent back burner project for like eight, 10 years. And then suddenly one day I'll get the mood and I'll, pull it out and finish it. And that's happened enough times that now, uh, sometimes I genuinely don't know whether I'm just dragging along um, project and failing to admit that I have to quit or whether it's genuinely something that's an option that I'll exercise in the future. So in those cases, I give myself the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, maybe I'll finish this someday. But in other cases, it's like totally obvious. I'm just dragging it out and then I just kill it. And it's like a Schrodinger's cat. Like you're not really sure if it's dead or not yet. There's there we go. <laughs> Thing. look at it but you don't know when the right time to look at it is yeah quantum quitting that's what we should call it quantum, quantum quitting, quitting. <laughs> yeah I don't, yeah i think i think i think there's a lot of things i'm a quantum quitter at i think that's true <laughs> yeah i think we just discovered a great new meme concept here quantum quitting we just need to tie in a cat somehow but yeah I have an example of a project that i'm quantum quitting uh, right now which is okay. i made up this uh, card game. Oh, were you at? Oh, yeah, you saw it. The Quadrantology card game that uh, I debuted at the last Free Factor camp. So I designed it. I designed the whole scheme. I designed like ways to play with it. I designed the assets and had the artwork done. I printed yeah. them. So I have like 20 sets of this card game ready to go and like enough play testing that it's I'm confident in it. But somehow and I have a personality test attached to it that I have tested and administered to like a couple of hundred people. So this project is at like the 95% down stage. All it needs is the 5% push where I like, I even have a website with all the details. So I have almost everything. I just need the will to like do a couple of final last things, push the button, and then it's a live project. But yeah. something about it is like quantum uncertainty for me and I'm not able to like either quit it or launch it. So that's an example. Yeah, that's a great example. I should launch it. Maybe, Maybe you should push that button and like see what happens. I don't know. Uh, here's the hold up. Uh, it, it, it's usually like this for me. Like there's one small stupid bottleneck that doesn't actually represent much time or effort. So mm -hmm. my inventory of questions in the personality test, it has 28 questions. And for mm -hmm. various symmetry reasons to make the score come out right, I need to add four more questions and make it a 32 question inventory. And then I have to uh, rebuild the type form that I was using and turn on Stripe integration so I can charge for it. So I already did this once. I was charging for it before, but the beta version of the test. So yeah. for some reason, it's just identifying those four questions that I have to finish up and then reopening the test for administering. That's holding me back. And I don't know why. Man, I feel like this is like hitting the you can't find a spoon, so you're giving up on ice cream thing. Like, <laughs> exactly. I feel like you like, hit like the perfect, this is like the, the perfect storm of then cat quit. Like, yes. Uh, quicksand, if you want to call it that. Like, That's exactly it. It's, and actually, since you bring up spoons, I think this is related to spoon theory. Have you heard of spoon theory? No, oh, so it's this kind of cringe pop psychology uh, 
memes slash idea in social media of uh, people who are dealing, some of them genuinely dealing with like extreme, like uh, chronic illnesses that makes them very low energy in certain ways. And they think of it through a metaphor of spoons, as in, in the morning when I get up, I have like eight spoons and I can use them on eight tasks, but once I'm out, I'm out. I can't do even the smallest thing, right? So something like that. And the spoon theory has become like this popular self-diagnosis tool and people talk about it and like seek sympathy from each other. I would say about 20% of it is genuine people who have like some sort of, you know, uh, actual chronic condition, but 80% of it is just quitters like me sort of taking refuge in spoon theory for shit they should just like fuck it up and do. And anyway, spoon theory, yeah. So I'm a spoon theory faker. Yeah, it sounds like it. I'm just going <laughs> to find another spoon and it'll be yep. fine. Yeah, um, I'll do it sometime, yeah. This, this is, I'm, I'm fairly sure this will ship at some point. I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to the day that it, it emerges from its uh, quanta. Yeah, it will, it will. Um, All right. What's the so next we have deal? a couple more things. Do we like go through them really quickly? What is yeah, quick? So you put you put quis, quixoticism. I'm not even saying I'm not even saying that right. What is quix, quixoticism? Quixotic. Oh, I made up the word, so it's being quixotic. Oh, okay. So that's um, I think quixotic should be pronounced quixotic, but of course the book slash character should be Quixote. So Don Quixote, the uh, Cervantes uh, novel, right? And for yeah. those who are not familiar with it, it's, um, it's basically a parody of uh, chivalrous knightly culture. And it's about this guy who kind of wants to be a knight and he has his uh, squire Sancho Panza and he goes tilting at windmills. So that's where the phrase comes from, where he pretends that windmills are dragons that he's slaying and he charges at them. So like the culture of knightly chivalry is long dead for centuries. So he's going around LARPing basically. It's what we would, we would call a LARP um, in modern <laughs> times, right? Um, but I put it yeah. down there because I think I'm a, I'm a pretty quixotic person. A lot of the stuff I do uh, strike other people as like, you know, quixotic. Why are you doing this uh, shit? Like um, absurd stuff. It's like having absurd objectives. I, I would say you are very quixotic too. Like why on earth would somebody make um, Faraday cage for 5G protection or something like that? So you're quixotic and yeah, I think Scorpios <laughs> are quixotic. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, for the lulls, of course. Like, why would you not build yourself a, a cage to sleep in? I mean, it keeps the bugs out, too, which is kind of nice. The bugs and the nargles. What did you say? Sorry, I missed The that. bugs and the nargles. Yeah, exactly. It keeps them all out. It's great. It's a very <laughs> relaxing place to, like, you know, get some, get some rest. Yeah. Um, and I think Luna Lovegood, who I've compared you to, is also a very quixotic character. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah it's, I it's see. Like, in a way, you're a little spaced out and living in your own fictional reality, and things mean different things in your reality than they do to other people, right? Everybody yeah. else sees a windmill, but you see a dragon that deserves to be charged and slayed. So quixoticism yeah. is, I think, an ability to do really deep suspension of disbelief and live in your own reality to a greater extent than other people. So I, I think I'm pretty quixotic. But I like the, I like this, um, it's like a marriage of like, it's not just, but it's not just like living in your own head. It's like a quest oriented. Um, it's like the, it's like questing, but like yes. the quest that you set out on. So like, I think, and I think this is how I, I would agree definitely that it ties into Scorpioism. Because Scorpios are known for being like slightly ambitious. Um, so like the, it's the like, it's like the, I'm, I'm kind of detached and zoned out, but questing for things that no one else can see um, to some extent for reasons that are probably fairly murky to other people. Um, but we're questing after them like quixotically. Um, yes, I, I think you touched on a very important point there, which is things that others can't see, right? There's, um, so this is, uh, we are congratulating ourselves on being geniuses, but one definition <laughs> of genius is genius, uh, hits the target others, or talent hits the target others can't hit, but genius hits the target others can't see, oh. right? And I, yeah. I think it's actually kind of true because it's, it gets at a truer sense of genius than simply super, super smart or something. We talked about this, I think I mentioned this quote before in uh, Feynman versus um, Julian Schwinger, right? Um, yeah. So it's that kind of thing where it's not necessarily that you're much smarter than others in a high IQ sense, but in a sense of you have a capacity for quixotic questing. 
and you're like, it's real in your head. And when it becomes real, other people look up and say, how did you ever think to do that? And they can't see like, why on earth anybody would think to do that and actually get there, even if it's not actually that difficult or like intellectually hard to do. It's like just even thinking to do it at all is a quixotic thing to do. So yeah. Right. Kind of like, I mean, kind of like Feynman, like deciding you want to like crack all the safes at Los Alamos, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's an absurd goal, yeah. yeah. And there's an element of absurdity. There's an element of like severe, serious imagination as in nobody else would imagine it. And yeah, there's a questioning element of boldness as in you have to put a disproportionate effort based on how much other people might value it, right? Like right. if you sold your plants for Faraday caging your bed, I don't think you'd find many buyers. It's, it's not like uh, something that's an economically valuable thing that you could sell to other people. So, but in, at a personal level. I don't know about that, Ben Cat. I could probably sell some Faraday cage beds. Like, let's just right corner of the internet. Okay. Like, I think I could make <laughs> some real gold. Um, All right, um, that's a challenge. If you sell your, uh, you should make the designs. Okay, here's a challenge for you: document the design and see how many people download it off of uh, GitHub or wherever, and right. that'll be. Yes. I'm gonna write this down. All right, and. Uh, I've been meaning to write it up. I haven't. One of the reasons I haven't written it up yet is because I haven't managed to figure out who has a sensor that I can like get nice little graph plots of what it does. Um, apparently that equipment well, is quite expensive. And like some almost like, I actually started emailing someone here locally who like had a couple projects around like real Faraday cages that are actually used to protect people from like high voltage stuff. Um, like real industrial uses of Faraday cages. Um, and he was like, oh yeah, I didn't tell him what the project was because I I couldn't figure out how to like put it in an email without someone that had actually met me without them thinking I was a complete loon or nut. Um, like, anyway, so I didn't end up telling them what it was, but they were like, oh, maybe there's like a university that you could like take your project to. And I was like, I don't think I can, I can't mm -hmm. take my project anywhere. It doesn't, it's it's a bad. it doesn't fit through the door. It's like a in-site site installation. Like this baby's not going anywhere without some help. Uh, hi, I should ask my friend Artem if he has any ideas. I think I mentioned Artem to you before, Artem Litvinovich. He's yeah. the art lab on Twitter. And he runs this really, it's like a museum of quixotic hardware hacking projects. It's called um, Orbide, O-R-B-I-D-E-S dot org. So orbital designs, that's what he calls it. So he's this uh, reclusive Russian hacker who lives in Moscow and builds all sorts of weird contraptions. And I think he's built a couple of Faraday cages as well for unrelated things, not like yours. So he might have an idea on how to do a sensor thing. But yeah, uh, I'm glad you reminded me of Artem because if I had to think of like the most quixotic hardware hacker type person I know, that would be Artem. Like he's the Don Quixote of hardware hacking. He literally goes around making like projects nobody else would think to make or do and he does it really well puts a disproportionately ridiculous amount of effort into them. And then uh, he puts them up and a few people like me latch on and say, hey, that's cool. But in general, he really struggles to get like, you know, attention for his projects because it's hard to appreciate quixotic things. I mean, that's almost a definition. Like quixotic things appeal only to particular tastes. The yeah. quality of a quixotic good is hard to ascertain. Um, Oh, cue for quality. Yeah, quality. Yeah. yeah. All right, should we have a couple more things? Quality. All right, what else do we have? Let's finish it we up. Yeah, quarantine. Quarantine. <laughs> quarantine. Which we almost didn't put on the list. And then at the last moment, we're like, wait, we should talk about the obvious elephant <laughs> that is the room, right? And we're not, we're like in the elephant room that is quarantine. At least I still am. I was like, so I was actually on a call today with two of my coworkers. One lives in Australia and one lives in Switzerland. And we realized that they're both having their normal lives for the most part still. Whereas my, the city I live in, Houston, Texas, has recently become, we think, I might be wrong about this, but close to like the number one hotspot, as yeah. we know, as far as we know it in the world period mm -hmm. for like resurgence in cases. I think that's true. I think that's Yeah, like I think it is. It's either you guys or Florida, I think. I think. It's either yeah, Houston or somewhere in Florida. I'm pretty sure Houston, well, Houston has the most people out of all the other places. Like it makes yeah. sense that we would be peaking. 
Anyways, yeah, so I am, we are, we're rolling back into quarantine. We rolled out a little bit, you know, we kind of rolled out and now we're like, oh no, 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 we're back in it. Like, <laughs> here we go. Like, oh, everybody back inside, wear your masks. I don't know. Um, I think like the, you know, it's like back, there's some backpedaling, like the rolling metaphor is good because we're like pedaling backwards. Like mm-hmm. we were like really on the bike being like, let's go forward, roll everything out. Like maybe even like a week ago that the governor of Texas, uh, Mr. Greg Abbott, and um, I can't remember his lieutenant governor is also usually on people's like shit lists for being terrible. Um, I think his name is Dan something. Um, But like, anyways, they were like, oh yeah, Texas is open again, economy, come back. Here's wide open for you. And then this week, I think they're like shutting things back down. I can't remember what the most recent thing that was getting shut down is. I don't remember, but. This is connecting back up to the quantum stuff this is like a quantum quarantine because it's um, driven by i think we called this uh, before we called it the heisen bug or something right mm. because you never know whether you have covid or not right and the testing has its problems and all sorts of for a whole bunch of reasons you never quite know whether you have the bug or have had the bug or could have the bug <laughs> so it's like the quantum bug and so this is the quantum quarantine yeah right are we in quarantine or aren't we and everyone's like we don't know we think we are but yeah california is kind of in the same way it um, was severe lockdown then it eased up a little bit now a bunch of counties are back under severe lockdown and i think uh, people are kind of now vaguely uncertain about what is and is not allowed so yeah yeah very uncertain quarantine state yeah, but, but it's I mean, interesting just, they're calling it quarantine because it's not actually quarantine. This is mm-hmm. shelter at home or stay at home stuff. Like literal quarantine is what China and other um, more draconian states are doing, which is if anybody shows any symptoms, you sort of go take them from their homes and like shove them into an internment camp and don't let them leave, right? That's like, actual okay, quarantine. Yeah. Maybe Nowhere we should do that. Maybe yeah, we yeah. should like stop calling this quarantine, just call it like hiding the fuck out at home and like actually do quarantine, like actually set up places that we like spirit people away to for weeks. Like I, hear I that think that ship has failed. Like that would have been an effective strategy like in early March or late February, but now I think it's too late. Like if you can't like actually contact trace and lock everybody down, it's like no point. Plus civil liberties stuff, I think fundamentally the U.S. has made like a political choice that individual freedom is valuable enough that we'll take like way more fatalities. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point we're just like plowing towards herd immunity, right? Like that's like the, is that a strategy? We will find out. It's a de facto strategy, I guess. And it's, but but it's really far away. Like herd immunity, I think is like 60% or something. So there's a huge number of deaths along the way if you want to like barrel there. I think we're headed, I mean, it seems like, I don't know, ship's headed some direction. How many cases, I think there's what, uh, more than 100,000 fatalities in the U.S., so that's like 20% of the world. So I thought the we were US getting is like 120, 130. 120, and the world overall has gone over half a million, which is ridiculous. Like, the U.S. Mm-hmm. is like, what, 5% of the world's population, but has more than 20% of its fatalities. So that's like ridiculously bad record. But uh, yeah. Well, maybe yeah. we're just better at counting than everyone else. I don't know. And I that, don't think so. I mean, case counting, I would agree. Like counting actual cases and doing the testing. Yeah, the US is probably better. But fatalities are hard to hide. Like even the worst governed countries, you can't like hide corpses piling up and like, you know, graves overflowing and stuff like that. So I don't think deaths are being undercounted significantly. You seem skeptical. <laughs> okay. China, maybe. China probably has a lot of underreported deaths because they can lock it down. But most democratic countries, you can't actually hide this many people dying. I think that's true. Yeah, I guess I was more giving you like the skeptical face for like the fact that we have no idea what's happening in China. Like, Yeah, yeah China, definitely. They're, they're lying they about do, a lot of stuff. They do a much better job of controlling the outflows of information from their populace than yeah. anyone else. That right. does. Do we have any more cues left? We have queens. Queens, okay. All right, you're the queen here, so. 
Go. Am I, um, <laughs> I don't feel like I earned it, but maybe that's the whole experience of being the queen is that it's not something you earn. There's two of us and you're the only uh, eligible person to be the queen. <laughs> Right. So like, but, but maybe that's part of the queen experience, right? Is like the grappling with like, this is who I am just by nature of existing rather than any amount of like being selected into it, right? Like, I guess you could marry into royalty, but then you might oh. see it coming with a little bit of time to... That was actually, I think, a big political sort of struggle through centuries. Like uh, the question of whether... Um, if a monarch had only female children, whether women could inherit the throne, I think that has been a question through the ages. And uh, like, I think most of Europe somewhere in like the Middle Ages kind of decided, yeah, women can be queens. And uh, it was kind of, I think, a political pragmatic trade-off. It's like, either you let women be queens or the throne passes to some shady line of cousins out in the provinces you don't want infesting the capital, right? So it's almost like consolidate political power. Compromises, you know? The yeah. cousin or the girl. I don't know, tough <laughs> choice. Like, uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite queen? Like real queens? I don't think so. I don't really- Victoria, Elizabeth. History is not a thing that like, my brain is really good at like, yeah. like personal, like I should, I should qualify that. I think like, personalized history, certain amounts of personalized history, personalization history, history of people, mm -hmm. depending. I don't know. I mean, Carrie Fisher, if Carrie Fisher were a queen, I would put her pretty high up on my list, but I don't think that um, she's ever ruled anything other than like well, the fictional. outer space. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Outer space. So she was the queen of the rebel forces or something, I guess, or general. Yeah, she was. So she would definitely be on my list of like favorite queens. Um, but like real live ones, I don't know, dude. Um, yeah, the, the ones I have enough personal knowledge of to have an opinion at all, they don't rate highly. Like um, Indira yeah. Gandhi in India, she was effectively a queen for about three, four years. So Indira Gandhi was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister. And mm -hmm. she pretty much became prime minister 100% on the strength of being the daughter of the first prime minister and she took over the leadership of the Congress. But she's famous for a period in 1977 when she imposed a general emergency. And for two years, she ruled as basically an autocrat. And she became like possibly the most hated <laughs> leader of modern independent India. And I was just three or four years old at that time. So I don't have any memories. But you talk to like adults who were alive at that point, including my parents, and they like absolutely hate what she did. <laughs> But yeah, the so oh. queens are, so that's actually a good thing to you know, like queens are no better than kings, like absolute power corrupts, absolutely. It happens to men and women. Yep. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, right. I don't know. I think what there's like Catherine, Catherine the Great, who did things in Russia, like the attempted to do like a great leap forward, but the Russian version, right? Mm -hmm. Back in, I want to say like 19, early 1900s late 1800s that's like kind of a that's sort of in like a i feel like this is like sort of touching on our last episode where we talked about progress but there's something interesting going on there with like rulers or like um this is like totally off queen topic but um like rulers that like decide that their country needs to like evolve like mm -hmm. we need to get to the next level and they're like all right next level guys we're gonna do it and like <laughs> all of you are going to like starve, like half of you are going to starve, but we as a nation are going to get to like, whatever the fuck the next level we have decided is. And so like you, all you do is your beards are shaved. That's going to like help us get to whatever thing, sacrifice that we need to make to the God of progress. We're going to burn your beards. And then like, I don't know, I can't remember what else she did, like Catherine. Oh, she did she literally do that? Like, uh, make a law about beards or something? Yeah, she cut off all her like advisors' beards. Like, all the guys in court had their like long Orthodox Christian beards like shaved because that was huh. not a thing that they did in the West or something. That's that's kind of interesting. Huh. It was so, like a sign of progress. You needed to see the progress, Van Cat, and the easiest way to do it is make your people look like the part of the Western man. Or 
Yeah. And I'm trying to think if men or women have more of a tendency to like drive great leaps forward, but I think it's kind of evenly distributed. Like uh, Queen Victoria and um, Elizabeth I both kind of had, uh, are associated with like ages where their particular countries uh, kind of leaped forward to some extent. But, but partly it's being the monarch at the right place at the right time. Like if the country is poised for a leap, you either say yay or nay. Yeah. Do you think that like great leap forwards like that are quixotic? Yes, they can be. Oh, okay. Um, good thing you brought that up because I just thought of a king, not a queen, um, who is literally the Tughlaq of um, South Asia. So this was a guy named Muhammad bin Tughlaq. So the Tughlaq dynasty was one of the early pre-Mughal dynasties of India. And mm -hmm. this guy was like super quixotic, but not in the Don Quixote sense of an individual knight having an individual quixotic thing, but um, quixotic at the scale of a nation where he had, he was like a super cruel, horrible, despotic guy in all the usual ways medieval kings used to be. Uh, so that was like par for the course, but in some ways he was really weirdly modernist and tried to do a lot of, things that only he saw the logic of, but it was like simply too premature. Like uh, uh, he introduced token currency. So this was like back when around the world, people were still doing silver and gold, right? And he introduced like token currency. I don't, I don't remember whether it was base metal or paper, but it was like basically representative currency. And this was in the, when was the Muhammad bin Tughlaq? I think 13th century, maybe, maybe 13th or 14th. But yeah, so back when it was not a thing. And of course he did it really badly and completely fucked it up. And it was like very easy to like fake that particular currency. So that project failed. Um, then because at that period, India was undergoing a lot of invasions from like Huns. Um, he came up with this grand scheme to move the capital from Delhi to this new city he made up called Tughlaqabad, like much further south to escape the invasions. But then again, he went about it in a very quixotic way, which is not just move the government and like, you know, state officers and the court down there, but literally move the entire city of Delhi, like pack up every last dog and beggar and put them in a great big caravan and march them south to start a new capital. And that project failed completely disastrously. So he's like a, he's a chapter in Indian history textbooks, which you learn about in school. And he's, history teachers point this out that, he was a guy with a bunch of really advanced, seemingly quixotic ideas for his time, and mm. they all uniformly failed. So yeah, so that's my example of the Indian Quixote. Indian Quixote, trying to relocate yeah. Delhi. Huh. I like, it's interesting that he like, he was like, no, no, the city needs to move. Like I want the entire experience, not just you and me and my friends, but like the whole thing down to like the nuts and bolts needs to like be replicated because I don't want to leave it behind. I want to take this yeah. somewhere else. Something like that. I'll have to look up the details of what exactly he did. Oh, but to finish the story in a modern setting. So his name Tughlaq has become a byword for quixotic questing in Indian culture. So just like the word quixotic in English means this kind of absurd questing. In India, the word Tughlaqs sort of connotates that, and there's a modern magazine named Tughlaq, which is kind of like satire. It's a satire magazine, and it's named after him. So it's called Tughlaq, and it's like a satirical political commentary magazine. Oh, that's cool. That's really good. Mm. All right. Oh, and Tughlaq ends with a Q. It's spelled T U G H L A Q. So we have a Q in there. Sounds like with it, we should end on the Q then. Um, exactly. The Good. All right. That was a fun, I think that was a 10 point episode. Q is a good 10, 10 point letter. Yeah, it was 10 points for Q. I like All it. Right. All right. Uh, thank God it's always a pleasure and I will talk to you next week. Talk to you next week, Lisa. All right. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.